So, welcome again. Uh, this is our third in a series talking about uh, software asset management influences in the uh, ANZ market. We've got a bit of a different approach today. Uh, with me today is Niall Ellery. He's from uh, our partner Livingston Tech. Um, he's going to give us a global perspective on what's happening in the software asset management world. Now, Niall's responsible for the software asset management organization within Livingston Tech. Um, we've spoken to two tool providers um, in the previous two videos, which will be linked below. Um, today we're going to have a look at it from a different perspective. We're going to talk to a managed service provider um, and see if that take on the software asset management world is any different from what we've heard already. So, mm -hmm. welcome Noel. Hey, it's great to be here. I will say, really enjoying the Sydney winter weather. It's about the same as summer back home. So. <laughs> <laughs> good to hear, good to hear. So, uh, the first question is the same question we ask everyone. Um, What's your perception of the challenges that are facing organisations that are looking at software asset management at the moment? So there's probably a few challenges coming through now at the moment. Um, some of them are the same as we've had before and then a few new ones. Um, certainly in the broader market we're starting to see a lot of tool based implementations from the last three to five years um, uh, not deliver what they planned on delivering. Um, so that's sort of driving a lot of behaviours within our customers. Um, we're seeing a lot of activity around audit still, um, so audit volumes are increasing, particularly with companies like Quest. Uh, Microfocus really, really up in their volumes of audits, uh, but you know all of the standard players are still going strong there. And we've certainly seen that here in Australia as well. Oh yeah, I can, I can yeah. imagine you are. Um, you know, we're starting to see a lot more of our customers push back on the audit side of things as well. I'll probably talk a bit more about that later. Um, but in response to that, we're also seeing you know, vendors like IBM hardening their audit clauses. So there's a bit mm -hmm. of a sort of arms race happening there with the increasing volumes where, you know, with cases like Mars versus Oracle, the Diageo case, and a couple yes. of other high profile cases, um, the C suite are starting to get a lot more aware of what an audit can be. Um, so there's a lot more sort of drive within uh, our customers to manage that. Mm -hmm. So, so I'll be interested to hear a little bit about how Livingston Tech is is dealing with those challenges on behalf of customers. Yeah. Um, but I think you're going to give us a, uh, a different perspective because yeah. you've got that global uh, view, yeah. you're European based. We often hear that um, Australia and New Zealand are maybe a couple of years behind what's happening in the SAM world. Mm -hmm. what, what's your take on that? It's an interesting one. Uh, I've worked in Australia for quite a few years before I moved back to the UK. and. From my perspective, and you know, now that we're working with you, we're see, still seeing quite a lot of what's happening out here. From a tools perspective, Australia has always been sort of you know level or, or sort of close to with the, the UK in terms of deployment. You know, we you know Flex, you know, all those, you know, you know the other guys you've had talking, you know, have, have got some pretty big deployed bases here. Um, but where we're seeing things sort of fall a bit behind is in terms of the results that people are getting from those tools. And mm -hmm. um, so people aren't necessarily getting. The value out of those tools they possibly could, um, and from an audit defence marketplace, we're seeing it. Uh, we're not seeing the same pushback levels we're seeing elsewhere. So, you know, uh, people are more likely to give the auditors whatever they ask for. We got without really questioning that, and um, we're not seeing the same level of understanding of the risks associated with that data when it's yeah, and there's huge out. financial implications if exactly. you give all information. Exactly, you know. So, so probably one of the. Um, Weirdest examples we've seen so far is one of the vendors asked for setup.exe as a, one of the keywords that they wanted to search for. And we're like, why? You know, we, we, we really pushed back hard on that. But it seems that customers, act, that people actually give that data over, mm -hmm. which, is, it, which is, I think, a bit nuts. Okay. So, so I think you've encapsulated a lot of the, the challenges. I'm, I'm sure there's more, but yep. you, know, you picked up two key things there around um, tool implementations mm -hmm. and that whole audit process. Yep. So what's your perspective on how you solve or resolve yeah. some of those challenges? Well, so first of all, a lot of this is customer driven. Um, we're seeing a lot more of the RFP, RFQ type uh, documents come out with more of a results based approach in mind rather than I need a tool. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, that's worked well for us. It's what we were set up to do from day one. Um, you know, our approach is take the data, run it through our tool, automate as much as we can. Uh, but then have our subject matter experts work on the back end um, to 
make sure that we're delivering optimized effective license positions to our customers. So technology plus expertise. To, exactly, yeah. yeah. It's, 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 you know, so we use the expertise to set up the technology, but then at the back end, we use the expertise to make sure that that effective license position coming out is correct. You know, in the corporate world, most people don't have standard contracts. Um, so unless you have that expertise level there at the end, you're not going to capture that. Mm -hmm. But also there's a lot of grey areas within contracts, and I'm sure you can talk about all the Oracle ones, like the 30-day rule yes. and the 10-day rule and yeah. all those sorts of things. But in order to make sure that we can take advantage of all of those grey areas, that, that, that human piece at the end mm -hmm. of having somebody who's been you know, doing Oracle, IBM, Microsoft, whatever vendor it is, you know, day in, day out. And we've certainly stressed over time that Understanding your contractual yeah. rights is, uh, is key to yes. actually um, managing your software effectively. Oh, yeah, without a contract, you're pretty much hands, your hands are tied. Um, so, from a results point of view, we've always been focused on that, and probably a very good example of that recently for us is we were working with one of our US customers on a SQL Server um, effective license position and looking at their architecture plans, uh, and just by talking to them about how they were deploying virtualization, how they're using their developer licenses. Um, talk to them about you know correct interpretation of things like active passive rules. I don't want to get into too much of the nerdy yeah. stuff here, but uh, we were able to you know knock a, sig a significant seven figure sum off uh, their next true up. Uh, so, so, so you so think that's driving still driving a lot of the decisions around SAM? It's that cost savings, oh, uh, yeah. risk avoidance. Exactly. It's 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 we are you know we've we've always taken that approach, but we're actually seeing it come through in the uh, from our customers now, our potential customers now. They're not just looking at give me an ELP, they're looking at give me a result and that result is usually a risk reduction or a cost save type approach and it, it's, it, mm -hmm. for me it's refreshing, it, it's about time to be fair, uh, it, it's, it's exactly what we as SAM professionals should be doing is delivering results and, it's, and, and, yeah. the, end, and the end results are about reducing risk and, and financial or otherwise and reducing and cost. And we're seeing a lot more of organisations looking to SAM to be accountable Yep. Um, and you can't be a cost center anymore, you have yep. to be a value add. Exactly. Are you seeing any conversations around um, that understanding of a licensed estate, software estate, is helping to make more informed decisions around transformation? Oh. We hear digital transformation all the time. Definitely. Um, you know, if you look at probably the biggest conversation happening at the moment around cloud, um, in our world anyway, in order to understand what you can do about cloud, you need to understand what you've currently got. Mm -hmm. if, if you go to cloud without understanding your contracts, without understanding your current deployments, you're effectively writing a blank check to publishers come audit time. Um, so you really need to make sure that you understand what your entitlements are. You know, Does this contract allow you to move software to a hosted mm -hmm. solution? Does it allow you to uh, third parties to host that solution? Um, you know. There is such a range of issues around cloud at the moment, um, and you know we'd rather be on the front foot with our customers, you know, than on the back foot trying to deal with this at all the time. Uh, and that's just one example of where having that understanding works. If if you talk to a publisher about oh I want to put stuff in AWS or Azure or whatever now before you actually do it, the chances of you having to pay a significant amount of money for that is relatively low because. There is no deployed volume for them to price on, yeah. um, so you know they're getting ahead of the game really. And does we're also make, seeing make a situations where you're you're paying twice for basically the same thing on premise as well as cloud doing the same. Thing. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So um, you, you mentioned the audit challenges, um, and I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. Yep. You know, if there are three things that you could tell our viewers that they need to do when it comes to audit. Keeping in mind that you know, don't give everything away yep. um, at the start. What what were those three things? Are? So the first is you need to understand your contracts. Hey, you know, from is there even an audit right within this contract? Yep. Hey, you know, from the basic things to what are the confidentiality provisions to what does this entitle you to do? So so the first thing is you know really really understand your contracts. The second is to control the audit. Don't let the auditor control you. Mm. You know, you know you have a business to run. You, you know, if they say, I want all of the data next week, you're quite within your rights to push back and say, well, actually, no, I need to get a non-disclosure agreement in place first. And that, you know, you need to protect your data, particularly, you know, with, say, GDPR, which is a big thing for us yes. in the UK, and, and all those things, you really need to make sure all of those sort of data protection issues are covered there. But also, make sure it fits in with your standard, with, with your timelines. You know, if you've got a change window in 
three or four weeks time uh, where you need to run their scripts. Well, that's it. Hey, I'm not running these for three or four weeks. So it's, it's, it's yes. not just that. The entire process, control the process. Mm. Um, and then our approach is pretty simple, which is don't hand over data unless you know what it's saying. You know, if, if the vendor asks you for a huge extract of a log file from some system, you need to question why that is, what is that data, what is that going to tell them, and you need to understand uh, what that is. And that's, you know, so mm. you know, and, and I think a, a key part of that understanding your data is actually going through a process of doing an ELP because that's going to combine your exactly. contractual yeah. rights with exactly. what that yeah. data says. Yeah. 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 This isn't about necessarily hiding anything from the vendor here. It's about making sure that you understand the risks, making sure that you understand what that data is telling you and, what your con and how to apply the contract to that. Because if you can't do that, the vendor will tell you what mm -hmm. that is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with you know, grey areas, so, you know, if you've got a processor definition from 15 years ago in your contract, you know, what does, how does that apply to now? Um, you know, there are, I, I, you know, I could spend all day talking about this, <laughs> Patrick, and, 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 and we've had these conversations before, <laughs> exactly. but they're always interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to change tack here a, a little bit. Um, we've talked a lot about the challenges and some of the solutions we see for our um, customers. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I think there are also challenges facing us as the SAM vendor or the SAM provider. So, so in your mind, what are the challenges that we face to deliver what our customers want? You talk about outcomes. You know? Yeah, so, so again, so the, the biggest thing, change I've seen in what our customers want is that outcomes-based approach. Uh, and for us, that works quite well. You know, it's, it's how, that's how we've been set up. We're seeing the two providers react to that in a slightly different way, which is they're actually going out to the market jointly with other uh, parties, so consulting companies, you know, the big four, whoever else it yes. is. Um, and you know, so they're, they're taking a slightly different approach to that. It's but it's, you know, still a tools-based implementation, just with add-on services. Whereas for us, our approach is give us the data. You know, we'll take data from whatever tools you have, as many tools as you have. Mm -hmm. And we will give you give you results back based on that using, like as I said earlier, so you know, the is that, is that expertise. driving more flexibility required from from us as um, oh, yeah. solution providers. Oh, com completely. Um, you know, we're starting to get more involved in the contracts that really matter to people. Mm. If five years ago, everything was, oh, can you do IBM, Microsoft? Can you do, can you do all the tier ones and maybe a couple of the tier twos? And um, whereas now, people are coming to us and say, here's my budgets for the next year. Um, tell me what you can influence, and and, and it's it's a it's, it's a much more interesting conversation for us um, because you know we get into some vendors we've never heard of, but for us it's about applying the exact same logical steps. You know, um, you know, give us the, what, what what data do we need? How do we get that data? What, how do we interpret that data? Uh, and how do we map that back to your contracts? Um, uh, so it, it's we're starting to see a lot more interesting things happen there. Um, but also the cloud-based conversations are very interesting, and uh, you know, people come and say, "Well, what about cloud? How's that? Do you know, what, how can you deal with cloud?" For me, it's the exact same conversation we've had with virtualization over the last, uh, you know, five to ten years ago. It's about getting us the data. It's about, it's about where does that data reside? Can we control that data? You know, if you've got fifty different people managing fifty different mm -hmm. instances mm -hmm. of cloud, then that's fifty different data sets we need. You can control that centrally. Then we have one set of data, and we, it, you know, the conversation becomes a bit different. Um, so, so there's, it's about, you know, there's a, there's a bit more governance type stuff in there as well. Um, probably the other thing that's probably been a bit more interesting in the last uh, probably two years is uh, some of the publishers are really focusing more on the counterfeit piece. Uh, you know, yes. It's always been there, um, but the, some of the publishers are really going after that a lot more. Certainly, reasons here, but when Adobe is in the conversation, exactly, so. yeah, or Dasso, <laughs> or you know, there's quite a few others as well. Yeah. Um, so we've talked a lot about what's happening now and, and and your impressions over the last few years. So, so my final question to you, Niall, is, um, what's the outlook for the next four or five years? What do you see um, remaining the same? What do you see yep. changing around software asset management for the future? I think we're going to continue to see that results-based requirement from our customers grow, and rightly so. Um, and for us, that's a welcome challenge. Um, you know, the cloud-based piece is still going to go on and on, and I think what we're actually going to start seeing very soon is a lot more cloud-to-cloud -cloud transition type activities. It's still fairly young, and we haven't seen anybody try to say, well, I want to move 3,000 servers from AWS to Azure, or vice versa yet. Yes. Um, so that's going to start to get very interesting there, and trying to understand what the license implications all of, all of that are. 
Um, and audits are going to continue to increase. Um, metrics are going to continue to get more complex. You know, uh, vendors are going to continue to try to find new and imaginative ways of monetizing their IP, and we're going to have to be at the forefront of making sure our customers are managing that and paying, you know, obviously paying paying the vendors fairly, but not necessarily. Uh, yeah, and and as solution providers, we need to be ahead of that to oh, ensure we exactly, can deliver yes. those outcomes we've promised to the customers. Exactly. Right? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So no, it's, it's it's going to be interesting, and yeah. well, I'm certainly looking. Now, Niall, I know that we've probably got another three or four hours of conversation to go ahead, <laughs> and, and I'd love to get an opportunity to have this uh, conversation with you in mm -hmm. the future. But that's the end of our session today. Yep. Uh, hopefully, there's some um, takeaways for you. Um, always appreciate the questions we receive yep. um, through the YouTube channel and LinkedIn, so please keep on doing that. And uh, thanks, everyone, for your time. Niall, yep. and appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you.